Uh, hello and welcome to Man V Film. With me today is Fran Simeone from the new boutique Radiance. Welcome, Fran. Thanks for having me. Uh, I know, first thing I want to ask is you've got to be very happy with the announcement and the way it's went. I mean, this has got to be the perfect scenario. Yeah, I, I mean, it's always great to see good feedback. Um, I'm just glad that people have kind of gotten on board with the whole you know, range of titles and the kind of diversity and mm. and that it's something different. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy right now. Because yeah. um, obviously it's that you've been with Arrow for such a long time and you've been with them as they kind of grew into being one of the biggest boutiques. And it's obviously a big risk to leave that and kind of go on your own. So what what drove that decision to do that? Yeah, it was uh, a big deal, uh, certainly for me. Um, I mean, there's no one thing really. It was it was just a few things that all kind of built up over time. Mm -hmm. Twelve years is, I think, is a long time to be in any yeah. job, really. So that's certainly part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing was that um, I think I just got to the point where I felt like I'd done everything that I could do at Arrow. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's no reason for the company to change to suit my whims or anything like that. You know. Mm -hmm. At Arrow, we spoke about like producing films and doing other things and doing, you know, books we tried that didn't really work out. I think that was more of a resource thing than anything. Mm -hmm. um, and vinyl, I'm, you know, I'm always interested in building and doing new things. So once I realised it was potentially viable for me to do that, the building aspect was sort of a mm -hmm. bit too irresistible for me. So um, I, I wanted to get back to that. I also wanted to be much more hands on mm -hmm. because inevitably at a big company you kind of end up you know being the overseer you know so any kind of department manager you know it's the same thing kind of mm. end up being focused on budgets and processes and you know managing people which I enjoyed doing but I, I kind of missed getting yeah. you know into the nitty-gritty and editing booklets and looking at special features all day you know, that's mm. that's what I started doing Arrow and I really wanted to get back to it so that was yeah. That was a big thing. And, you know, you're kind of the driving force behind this. You're the, the man at the, the, the front. You know, you're in all the, the podcasts and uh, the YouTube channels, whatever, doing the interviews. And it's all your choices. So is all the movies, are they your fault? Are they your decisions? Are you the, <laughs> the only one that comes up with them? Or do you have other people bringing them to you? So far, they're all my fault, yeah. Um, there's some in the future that I've, I've worked on collaboratively with, with Kat and Tom. And, and potentially other people as well in the future mm. um so it's a mix you know I, I really enjoy working with with people um i'm i'm not the sort of person who who can just sort of hunker down on my own and do everything i, I yeah. do like the back and forth that comes with collaboration so mm. certainly i'll be passing the blame along at some point but to be honest with you that the the choices that have, that have come in uh the films that we're talking about are are great because you know, whilst I'm, I'm certainly aware of lots of films that deserve to have a light sh shone on them, mm -hmm. like the first 10, um, some of the suggestions and, and things that we're looking at now are, are really exciting to me. So I hope they're exciting me, they'll excite other people. Yeah. So the first 10 films that you've announced, um, how did you go about choosing these? Were these the ones that you always wanted? Was it a case of these are the ones that are ready first and good to go? Or, or is this like a, a broad sampling of what you wanted to offer? I wanted um, it to be broad. I mean, what yeah. I really wanted to avoid was sort of going out with a couple of releases and people saying, oh, okay, so it's going to be like Jelly or, you know, this kind of thing and, and, and Japanese stuff. So I wanted to get Welcome to the Dollhouse in there. I wanted to get Miami Blues in there. I wanted to get She Dies Tomorrow in there, definitely, because I wanted to demonstrate that whilst a lot of them are from the 70s, and I do love, you know, 60s, 70s films and, and a big part of the slate will be from that era. I am mm -hmm. I absolutely love 90s movies and modern movies, so it's going to be from all over. I mean, my perspective is I'd much rather have a really good movie from like two years ago than a second-rate movie from the 70s. Yeah. So that's much more what I want to focus on. So that was a big consideration. Um, I did have a few other things I wanted to get in, so I didn't have so many 70s films, but... <laughs> Part of your point, you know, is is absolutely bang on. It, you know, it's these already, um, mm. so you know, it was it was 
that kind of necessity, really. Um, but in terms of why they were selected in the first place, it's a real mixture, really. I mean, the, the thing with film acquisition is it's sort of quite dependent on on the part that you're licensing it from, whether they've actually restored it, whether they've restored it to a, a decent standard, yeah. um, whether it's actually available. And that can be because some old license is knocking around. That's, you know, for anyone searching on Amazon or whatever might mm -hmm. think, oh, yeah, this is definitely out of print, but there might be old paperwork sort of blocking it. Right. So sometimes you just need to wait that out. Mm -hmm. um, some of them I've, I've known about for a long time and, and wanted to release, but just couldn't for whatever reason. Um, and others are relatively new discoveries, like Filler Up with Super, I maybe saw yeah. a year ago, a couple of years ago. It wasn't really right for Arrow, which kind of went into the back of the mind. And yeah, when I started up Radiance, I was looking over, I made a list, I think it was about 800 titles. Wow. <laughs> and um, I, I just sort of thought, yeah, this, you know, this needs to be released because I really enjoy Alan Cavalier's films. I mean, right. mm -hmm. he, he, he's a really interesting filmmaker because he's had such a sort of strange career like most filmmakers i think was sort of playing a couple of lanes or maybe even one lane but mm -hmm. he just kind of did something different in various parts of his career he started off making genre films basically right. um around this time of the new wave um but they were sort of quite political so that was sort of about the algerian war and stuff like that mm -hmm. and um, none of them were a success <laughs> Um, they just weren't sort of in fashion at the time, really. I mean, I think they're good films, but um, people wanted to see different stuff or yeah. like, like comedies or whatever. So he, he kind of got fed up with that and he changed tack and he made, um, uh, I just can't remember what the first change was now. My dates are not in order, but um, this was one of the first where he just decided to do something completely different. Mm -hmm. And he collaborated with the cast um, they all got writing credits. They all apparently all got paid the same as well. So it's really? quite ahead of its time, really, yeah. in that respect. Um, and it's just such a really enjoyable film. It's it's hard to sort of find a comparison for it. Like, you know, it's a road movie, but it's like a touching comedy as well. Um, and it's just very true to life. It's like a youth story, essentially. Um, and, yeah, I just I thought I had to have to release this, you know, what really? Cavalier to kind of be part of the label because what i did with arrow and what I definitely want to do going forward is certainly focus on a few really good filmmakers and, and put mm -hmm. out more and more of their work because i love i said it on a podcast the other day i sort of see myself more as a kind of cataloger than a kind of collector yeah. mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm more interested in getting all the films than i am of having all the different versions of yeah. stuff or the slipcase or the toy or whatever you know yeah. once upon time maybe but now i'm sort of have this like you know rabid mm -hmm. insatiability for just seeing everything i can really um and it's we live in a great time because i think boutique label collecting has has broadened out so much that things you thought you could never see are sort of suddenly becoming a reality so yeah. it's it's very exciting i think it's, it's something i particularly love about boutiques is i feel as if there's a, a someone curating a collection for me you know i i, I always think I, I know a lot about movies. I've seen a lot. And then someone comes along with 10 titles uh, and I've seen two of them. Uh, and it's it's exciting because you're looking at them going, I'm going to experience this filmmaker for the first time. I'm going to see what this has to offer. I may like it. I may not. But it's having that option to try something is pretty fantastic. So I love to hear announcements when I know nothing about the movies. It's just exciting. So we're going to jump into uh, your website here radiancefilms.co.uk where we've got the list of your first uh, so many titles first 10 now you kind of talked about filler up this was one that i initially i looked at and i thought i don't know if that's really something for me but you've you've kind of won me around a little bit uh, on that um you know is, it's is quite anything? a tough film to sell i must say yeah. I, I do kind of struggle writing the synopsis it's, it's <laughs> yeah. one of those films where sort of not a lot you know happens in terms of writing the plot but mm -hmm. It's got lo loads of really good scenes, but nothing that kind of adds up to the killer line in the synopsis. Because yeah. anything you'd mention would be kind of inconsequential when you're kind of reading it in terms of plot. But that's yeah. the kind of like the film is just very sort of freewheeling and it just mm -hmm. kind of goes on. Like, um, I think maybe like Sideways is quite a good example. It's like right. okay. two people go to wine country and 
Mm. And that's it. Like, what is that as a plot? It sounds really boring. But in a way, this is kind of similar. These people just kind of come together randomly and they just go on this journey and, you know, stuff happens and it's funny and it's touching. And I I think that's that's maybe the issue that you're looking at it and you're looking for a plot. Like you said, some movies don't have plot. They're they're more filler with story rather than Mm. necessarily plot devices to take them on. But yeah, I, I, I definitely think about that one. I want to talk about one of the initial releases you've got here, Big Time Gambling Boss. Now, I've never heard of the filmmaker. I looked into a little bit of the reviews, the synopsis you've got here. Sounds fantastic. So tell me a little bit about this movie. Yeah, so Big Time Gambling Boss is one of these films that's sort of very well respected and I think known much more so when it came out, uh, perhaps. Yeah. But it's never really been distributed very widely. So it's just one of these things that's kind of been a bit forgotten, really. Yeah. But um, when Paul Schrader was kind of preparing to write the Yakuza, he, he watched all these Yakuza films and he said that this one was basically the best of, of everything they made. Yeah. Um, and it comes at a time where, so this is like a period set film rather than like the Fukasaku, as many might be more familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, is slightly before when things sort of a bit tamer, essentially, in terms of like um, the way that these people are presented. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got the period setting. So it's like bridges the gap between like period samurai movies and the more modern Yakuza. It's, it's kind of in, in between a bit. Yeah. Um, but it, it, to my mind, it kind of takes the, the best bits of both of those, really. I think the way that I compared it to um, tell somebody was this is kind of like the godfather as to crime films as um, maybe the Fukasakus are like Goodfellas. So right. the, la- the later ones are kind of, much more in your face and a bit more loud and brash. And this is the kind of more contemplative, moody, dark. I mean, even, you know, in terms of its look, it's sort of a bit godfatherish as well. It's kind of moody and the lighting is sort of um, much more atmospheric. So it's it's not exactly like wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, although there are fight scenes in it, mm-hmm. um, but it is much more about characters and it is, you know, really engaging. And it's the same screenwriter as, Battles Out, Honour and Humanity and, right. and yeah. some of those other films that came later. Uh-huh. So it definitely has got that kind of intricate web of all the kind of the machinations of the of the Yakuza and, you know, loyalties and all that sort of stuff that would come up later. Um, and it's it's a really good watch. And Koji Saruta, who stars as one of the major uh, actors of this um, era and generation, mm-hmm. and, um, and he's fantastic in it. And then Tommy Saburo Wakayama, who most people will probably know from Lone Wolf and Cub, yeah. he's kind of the co-star, and he's very good as well. Um, I mean, he's always good. <laughs> yeah, it looks. Uh, it was the one that kind of jumped out to me straight away as something I was just fascinated with. It uh, looks really great. The other one for the January release is The Working Class Goes to Heaven. Now, this was a real struggle to find much information about it. I found a, a, a kind of uh, original language trailer on youtube but you know without the the, the subs or anything I, I was hard to press what's going on so it's a kind of drama uh, about an engineer working in a factory is that correct that's right yeah so uh, this is another one that's just kind of been a bit forgotten by time really i mean it, it mm. won the palm door uh jointly with the matei affair another amazing film starring volante uh mm-hmm. this has also been lost um but um, this one, I mean, for anyone who's seen Petri's other films, um, like Investigation of Citizen Above Suspicion, which was made the year before, you know, it's got that same magnetic performance from Volante. I mean, I think this is actually one of his best performances. It's just so manic and wild, um, mm-hmm. but, I mean, incredibly engaging. I mean, it, it, it's all about his performance in many respects. Um, but the film itself is a really interesting one in terms of Italian history because it, it does kind of hark back to the Italian comedies of years right. previous in oh. terms of how it's sort of slightly absurd. And and Petri, who's kind of, as a filmmaker, he, he would sort of bring in these kind of slightly surreal aspects to his film. So it's, it does that have that kind of edge. And it produces a really interesting film in that it's sort of much more um, complex than it really seems. Um, but it's also about very real things. I mean, ironically, with where we are as a society now, I think it's really relevant as well in terms of like workers' rights and fat cats and all that kind of stuff does does come in. And it's sort of you're watching it and you're thinking, God, this this could be, you know, a story from today, um, mm. which is a bit mad. But um, 
it's um, it's a very good film. As you know, as the synopsis sort of says, you know, it's the amazing score from Ennio Morricone. Um, it's so beautifully shot, mm. um, and I'm, I'm I'm really pleased with this one actually because, um, and and this is always the kind of the great thing about producing discs really is that you get to really dig in and and you find these little things and you think yes, it's kind of like just makes this better. Yeah. And um, we actually found so the restoration is very nice. Uh, mm. uh, uh, the film which we've received from the producers essentially but they um i don't know what they used as a reference they were trying to find that out but we found a print reference and two of the scenes have been graded incorrectly so we've been able to regrade them so oh, one of our one of the members of our teams uh, an excellent grader and um he's managed to look at those and, and bring them back to the way it was supposed to be shot um so that looks really nice and um and some of the extras that we've managed to find on it are, are really great as well. Just kind of, you know, just illuminating a bit more about like the film and, and the process mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's um, it's a delight. And the subtitles as well. I mean, so I first saw this on the Minerva DVD from Italy and it was, you know, I enjoyed it. But getting new subtitles is just, yeah. just adds that a little bit. I mean, my Italian's decent. You know, I can get by as, you know, watching some of the films in the slate uh, without subs. But mm -hmm it's not so perfect to catch every single nuance. So yeah. to get that now with the new subs is, is very good. Yeah. I mean, from what I saw in the trailer, it looked very visually, very striking. Um, mm. I just wish I knew what was actually going on. In that. Yeah. I'm that that forward. train is not very good. No, is it not? Is it not indicative of the. No, it's not the best. No, it's also terrible quality, which I think is just right. sometimes makes it a bit harder to really yeah. see what you're watching. So we've got, this is the initial January package. So we've got uh, the working class uh, goes to heaven and uh, big time gambling boss. This is your initial January release uh, along with cards. You got it for £30 on the site just now. I take it that's been selling uh, immensely well. Yeah, people love the bundles. I mean, this is sort of introductory pricing. So, I mm -hmm. mean, as the slate is across the board, it's all slightly cheaper than it will be going forward until yeah. October 5th. So the bundles going forward are probably going to be reflective of the the slightly higher pricing so maybe people are really going for it because of that i don't know but um i, I think people just like bundles and that's something you know yes. when i was writing out everything i wanted to do with the label i sort of made various notes of you know make this and do that and i, I do want to do that much more going forward you know mm -hmm. the the three-year package and there'll be other packages going forward as well i wanted to really take that as an opportunity to to be able to throw in stuff that's that's hard to make just as a standalone, like the books that I did previously, mm -hmm. I kind of just want to do that again, but just give them, you know, as part of the packages. So once the packages reach a sort of good enough number, um, there's various books that I, I'd like to do and, you know, cover off, you know, areas of cinema that I haven't been mm -hmm. written about and stuff like that. So that's really exciting to me to be able to do that. Um, Excellent. And, and they'll be in the bundles eventually as well. Great. Um, so that's that's going to be an addition. So you're going to you're talking about actual proper individual books, uh, and so much more included in the bundles. Much like um, I know Severin sometimes add in books to their bundles and things like that, but they're more genre specific and things like this is going yeah, to be. Yeah, I haven't seen any of their books. You know, it's, it's usually Partly film well. adaptations and, and things like that. Just oh, so you mean like the novelizations and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean that's really fun. I can't. I don't know if that would ever be relevant to the kind no. of films. Maybe, but. Yeah, that's tough from a rights perspective, though. You really need to have the rights, the right film hmm. to be able to do that. Um, okay, A Woman Kills. Uh, this one, uh, now this really kind of jumped out at me. I kind of like uh, kind of investigation movies. And is that what this leads towards? Is it an investigation of a serial killer? Yeah, it is in part. I mean, this is kind of a really interesting film in that it's got quite a few influences that kind of all come together. So it's mm -hmm. part uh, an investigation, but it's sort of more detached in that there's not a lead investigator. Right, um, okay. Not really, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you're much more focused on the serial killer. Um, so it's got a serial killer, but also a kind of true crime-ish style approach to it as right. well. Okay. Um, but shot kind of new wavy. So it's like mm -hmm. quite a handheld camera and it's quite free. It's on the streets, you know, it's, um, that which was very much, you know, in the culture at the time in terms of people making films. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the whole film really is, 
it's quite sad really is the way that it kind of had all these challenges and just couldn't overcome them and that's what led it to be buried yeah um, the filmmaker um which is all included on the disc actually so it's it's great I mean, mm -hmm. what i like is to be able to get into something and see the whole story which you which you can with this disc yeah um and that is his first short films were made and and, and they were fine you know they're quite interesting um, but then he made this film, um, The Sadness of the Anthropophagi. And it is quite, I mean, you can see why it's controversial. It's like, from a humorous perspective, like obviously critical of society, eating feces and um, other stuff like that, like typically like baiting, you know, yeah. it went to the French censor. So they were obviously like, oh, this is outrageous. And they thought it was so outrageous that they banned it outright, even from export. So it never got showed anywhere. Um, and so he kind of had that hanging over his head. But he went on, he made another couple of short films, uh, mm -hmm. which were good, and then started putting this feature together. And Anatole Doman, who's one of the legendary producers of the period, you know, produced films by you know, Goddard and René and Borovchik and... Mm -hmm. You know, all these amazing filmmakers he saw the rushes and he was really impressed and, and he said you know i want to help you let's see if we can get this into distribution so they pretty much finished the film and they they screened you know a kind of rough incomplete cut and the distributors perhaps with the whole kind of controversy hanging over it but their comments were it's got nudity but it's not an erotic film it's got a crime story but it's not fully crime because it's got like these horror aspects to it mm -hmm. it's got horror aspects but it's not we can't market it as a horror film so yeah it's really sad they just kind of passed on it and and Doman just kind of said you know we can keep trying and we can do other stuff and and Jean-Denis Bonin just basically said just, just leave it we'll just leave it we won't do anything wow. and it just kind of got buried and then um in 2010 um I can't remember who, what his name now, but there was someone who basically has carte blanche at the Cinémathèque Française and would play all these random films that, you know, had been buried or mm. very obscure. And this played. And everyone came, and Jean-Denis Bonin was there, and everyone came up to him afterwards and said, where can we buy it? We want to show our friends. And he mm. said, it's, it's not out. You know, they hadn't finished the credits or anything. So um, uh, this got to a distributor, Luna Films, Luna Park Films, and um, and they really liked it. And so they decided to finish the credits and put it out. Mm -hmm. um, but another kind of unfortunate set of circumstances, um, because France had kind of turned its back on the film, they decided to present it in Lausanne in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a very small festival. So it just didn't get any international exposure. I mean, for someone right. like me, yeah. You know, you're looking at films, you're kind of looking more towards, you know, the established um, archival festivals yeah. like Bologna or Lyon or, you know, one of the others that will be picked up and then it kind of goes on the circuit and Lausanne's not really in that. So no one saw it for, that was 2015. So until now, basically. And I can't remember how I came across it, but, um, you know, when I saw it and I saw the shorts, yeah. I, was, I was really impressed. And I just sort of thought, you know, this, this needs to be out there. That, that sounds fantastic it's that kind of history of a movie that's just never given its time to even shine is just uh, it's unbelievable that it happens it's great that it survived and it's, it's fantastic that we get to see it and you've got a bunch of extras on here as well talking about the director and short films by him as well so i take it it dives into everything that you've kind of been surmising there about the whole history of the film yeah so that the making of covers everything pretty mm -hmm. much that i just said but additionally i did an interview with um, Francis Lecomte, who's from Luna Park Films. Right. So I wanted to to make sure that that was all kind of captured because mm -hmm. if there's one thing I've noticed recently, it's that a lot of people say, "How did this get found? How did it get put together? What was state was it in?" So I asked him all those questions. Mm -hmm. So um, that's going to be in the booklet, along with sort of writing on the film itself, the shorts, um, and and various other. It's going to be about sort of four, five articles in the oh. booklet. So it's going to be quite a, quite. A, thick booklet yeah, um, yeah but that's something i'm trying to do across the board certainly for the launch slate i mean i think sometimes i think oh my god stop stop now going <laughs> overboard but um i think yeah just kind of i, I do like a nice thick booklet and yeah, i do yeah. want to read various mm -hmm. things 
Um, so the booklets are all, certainly for the launch site, are all pretty chunky. Good. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see whether that continues. But um, no, I think some, some, I mean, Welcome to the Dollhouse is probably going to be a bit short. There's only so much you can kind of write about that. Book. Yeah. Um, where that, there's the opportunity, I, I love digging into it. Yeah, that, this, this sounds fantastic. This um, You've definitely sold it to me completely. Uh, looking forward to checking that out. One of the movies I had seen before, Miami Blues. Um, so why did you choose this one? Because this is probably one of the, I'd imagine, a title that a lot of people have heard of. Yeah, well, it's a tough one because I agree with you. I mean, on paper, it kind of looks like that, but I think mm. it's still quite a sleeper. Um, I think a lot of people haven't seen it. Mm. Or I think maybe it was marketed a bit badly like the vhs was just kind of him with um his shirt off holding a gun and i think yeah. a lot of people might have confused it for sort of a different kind of film like maybe a bit cheesy or something yeah. but um it's Definitely really not. not i mean it's like it's really violent it's really yeah. funny i mean i think this is the precursor to tarantino really i mean i think without miami blues we wouldn't have like jackie brown mm. um you know that, that kind of mix of humor and violence for sure um and yeah so i mean I, I just think the film's really good i just really really yeah. like it so yeah you know, there's, there's a few things that i'm gonna do with, with mgm um right and okay. and this just seemed like a, a really good one to start with i yeah. mean i do want to focus as much as possible on uh blu-ray premieres but yeah. if one thing i've learned is that there's a lot of people in the uk who just don't want to import or maybe they are region locked and i know there's this whole just go region free but i understand that people might want to spend their money on blu-rays and not region free players so mm -hmm. yeah it, it can be costly um, so no i think this is a great title um i personally love the movie I, I can't wait to see the reaction of people who haven't seen it yeah, be yeah. Fun. um so red sun uh, again this red. was one that, that reading the synopsis it kind of sparked a bit of interest yeah, another one that's just completely lost to time, really. I mean, yeah. um, I'm still kind of digging in and, and doing lo lots of research as much as I can, at least anyway. Um, mm -hmm. The extras are certainly going to help sort of illuminate um, all of that for me. But um, what I know so far is that you know, Rudolph Tome was, uh, or Tome, as I was corrected the other day, um, he was this kind of filmmaker up and coming with like, Herzog and and yep. vendors and stuff like that, you know, as part of the new German cinema. And his films just didn't get exported. I mean, maybe they just, again, like the A Woman Kill situation, maybe just international distributors kind of mm -hmm. thought this isn't going to translate or whatever. Um, but he worked over like six decades in Germany, you know, very prolific filmmaker. Um, and I first read about this in uh, Kayla Janice's book, House of Psychotic Women, and so much like you said, you know, you kind of read a bit about it. I think this sounds intriguing. Yeah. And uh, I managed to get a copy of the film and I, I just sort of thought this is this is really good fun. You know, it's mm -hmm. like all the kind of things I like. It's a bit genre, but it's also like a bit adventurous in the way it's made. So it's not totally conventional. Like the way that all the sets are dressed are sort of really sparse. So it's it's much mm -hmm. more about um the situation and the, and the characters than it is about you know the the kind of production design kind of leading you so it's really sort of minimalist mm -hmm. um, but that kind of adds the whole era of the film you know in terms of what was being spoken about in terms of you know revolution and and mm -hmm. the women's liberation movement and all that sort of stuff um really comes to the fore which i think is really interesting at this time now um and ushi obermeyer herself it's a really interesting character. She was this sort of um, revolutionary who lived in Commune One, which is like an inspiration to John and Yoko and yeah. um, supposed girlfriend of like Mick Jagger and, you know, Keith Richards and, you know, all these kind of people, yeah. Jimi Hendrix. Um, so she's got this sort of really interesting story. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of narrative, it's quite interesting as well. I mean, obviously, you know, guy goes into a commune-like place and, he's going to be bumped off at some point, but will he or yeah. won't? It's just kind of like easy to get your head around, but the way it's made on top just adds a little extra, which I, which I thought was really fun. Um, yeah, and happily, you know, Rudolph had the rights himself. He'd restored it. We'd done a bit of extra work on it. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, yeah, and a great one to work on. Good. Um, okay, so a, a more modern release, uh, I think it's 2020 this came out. From yeah, right. yeah. Uh, she Dies Tomorrow. Now, this is one I heard a lot when it was initially released, but I never actually got around to seeing it myself. So tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so She Dies Tomorrow is is looks like a pandemic movie, but isn't a pandemic movie. I mean, Amy Simon's, and I think you, you can see it when you look at it, but she says definitely not a pandemic movie. It was mm -hmm. obviously written pre-pandemic, made yeah. you know, pre-pandemic, but released at the height of the pandemic, unfortunately, and for a film about contagion, um, I don't know whether it helped it or not, really. But, I mean, obviously just the, the shuttering meant no cinema release. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really good film. I mean, it's just my kind of thing, really, like sci-fi, sort of almost a bit dystopian in terms of, like, some of its themes. Um, but, you know, very thoughtful and interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's much more what I'm interested in. Um and it plays really well. I mean, I really enjoyed it. The, the kind of mix of like this very dark dread, but mm -hmm. also this sort of humour that just comes in, very sharp humour, um, which some people compare to, to David Lynch. And I, I do kind of see that stylistically, it's not Lynchian, but mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the tone of it, you, you could say that. And yeah. um, I think she's a really talented filmmaker. And yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, just, I'd much rather do a kind of really good modern film than yeah yeah um, I, everything I've heard has been great about it. I, I like the idea, you know, like a, the, the contagion of an idea, you know, mm -hmm. of a thought pattern. It's although it's nothing to do with point people, but that was kind of similar there. You know, there was a, an idea in that that kind of spread it. it, it it's something that kind of captivates my imagination a little bit. So yeah. hearing the good word of mouth, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, th this one is something that I really want to know a little bit about uh, the man in the roof nordic noir yeah so it's kind of i think the birth of nordic noir potentially i mean sort of in terms mm. of film i suppose it is because it was the first mm -hmm. um but i don't know where i first saw this but it's it's basically an established classic um for those who know it but mm -hmm. just kind of hasn't reached that kind of um public consciousness yet but I, yeah. I think it definitely will because it's a really impressive film um it's it's got quite an interesting backstory again i didn't choose all these films for their backstories but it just kind of does um and, but i only actually found out once i'd acquired and started doing the extras mm -hmm. but bo Vederberg um was this established director in the 60s right. who um was very well respected he was like the first filmmaker who could hold his own on an international basis mm -hmm. um, but he was very critical since Bergman but he was very critical of Bergman um, he basically thought that Bergman was sort of too highbrow talking about things that didn't connect with real Swedes and and he was much more about realism and, and things that people could understand you know that every man on the street could understand mm -hmm. and um he he basically got to this point where he sort of said you know in order to compete essentially like compete but um you know be on an international scale sort of have to make something mm -hmm. that will travel essentially yeah and he'd seen the french connection and he basically said we can we can do that we can do better <laughs> and and the man on the route yeah goes with it. i mean i love the french connection and i think it's yeah, one of the yeah. but man on the roof is very very good Mm -hmm. um it's definitely a crowd pleaser it's it's uh it's a thrilling narrative you know it's like edge on the seat stuff i mean i don't know how many times i've watched it now but i you know i still enjoy it every time i qc the subtitles again or yeah you know wherever it may be um it's a really enjoyable film i hope i hope it enables us to sort of do more uh Wiedeberg. Um, yeah but his yeah. other films aren't, aren't quite like this I, I love that idea you know i've seen the french connection I can do better. Yeah, That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even attempting that is, it demands to be watched. Again, I am a, a big Italian cinema fan. Uh, I'm also a huge Agatha Christie fan. Murder mysteries are my thing. So just reading that was an instant, wow, I, I need to know more uh, about this one. So go on. Yeah, so this one, I mean, I don't know which one I watched first, but we've got 
two Luigi Comencini films, and um, they're both really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, so his, this is another one that I hope we can sort of do lots of his work. Yeah. Um, but The Sunday Woman um, is first, and it's a really enjoyable one. I think maybe some people who've seen it before didn't quite hit the right. I was sort of looking at reviews. Mm. There was sort of a bit of sniffiness about it, and I think that's because some people watched it expecting like a typical Jallo, or maybe right. even like a Polizio Tesco or something. And it's mm-hmm. it's got elements of those genres, but not quite either one. Mm-hmm. It's sort of within the Jallo um, sort of tropes, but right. not quite. This is sort of more of a comedy, really. I mean, like I say in the synopsis, it's written by. Uh, Ajinore uh, Incrochin, um, God, or Scarpelli, surname. Anyway, they're credited as Ajin Scarpelli, and they're amazing writers to uh, 50s and 60s and 70s. Mm. And I think this is sort of like a really clever riff on like the Jallo and the Poliziotesky that they've right. done. And but it's really good on its own terms, you know, in terms of it, you know, having the mystery of the Jallo or you know, that. Agatha Christie style, you know, who done it essentially, which is what this is, is mm-hmm. essentially a who done it. Um, but it's got these amazing stars, you know, that Master Ayani's brilliant in it. Um, Bissett's really good. Trinton Young, I absolutely love. We've got like five Trinton Young films, I think. I mean, okay. he's amazing. Um, yeah. So, you know, all these things together, but with Comencini, who really needs to be better known. I mean, I think he's been much more lauded in France. They had a big retrospective of his work, I don't know how many years ago, but I think that brought his name much higher in France. But mm-hmm. hopefully on a more international basis, he's going to be better known because he's an exceptional filmmaker. Yeah, well, this, this, this is one that I'm super excited just to get to. The cast, the plot, the, the, the synopsis that you've wrote didn't lead me towards Policiateke or Giallo. It just made it out like a murder mystery. That was enough to kind of captivate me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the last one we'll talk about here that you've got is Welcome to the Dollhouse, Todd Salons um, from the mid-90s. Yeah, this so probably... this was quite an interesting one for me because I'd seen Todd Salons' uh, later films and I'd right. missed Welcome to the Dollhouse, even though I've seen the trailer about 5,000 times because it was yeah. on some VHS I had as a kid. But never actually got around to watching the film. And then this is one where I worked with the agent who was selling it uh, a lot and got on really well with and he was kind of like welcome what about welcome to the dollhouse so i watched it and i loved it i thought it was absolutely brilliant and i was like well, i have to do this definitely um yeah. and i looked at it and i knew it had a good master but it didn't have any extras so i said look if todd will do an interview um because i don't kind of want to put it out with no extras yeah um we'll do that and mm-hmm. it's like all agreed so that's you know progress and we're working on other extras as well but I just thought the film was just so good. I mean, yeah. I just sort of thought this this appeals to, you know, a good audience base who, who are going to be, you know, coming into the label. So that's kind of good for me. Mm-hmm. But hopefully I can convince people who like, you know, quirky Italian movies to watch Welcome to the Dollhouse House because it's just such a fun time. Yeah, it's, it's very it's true to that age as well. I yeah. remember being, you know, an awkward teenager. And, <laughs> and I think this speaks to that so well. He's brilliant at that definitely and then Matt Sarazzo gives a, a wonderful performance as a lead character as well oh yeah. amazing yeah yeah it's fantastic have you got any more salons on the menu um that is unclear at the moment I, I would I would love to I mean I think his later films are very very good hmm. um I did previously sort of think god do people want to buy those because they're they're tough watches I do think yeah. you like really think happiness is an excellent film <laughs> I do think Palindromes is very, very good. Yeah. yeah, but I mean... It's not, it's not the kind yeah. of Sunday feel-good movie that you throw yeah, on. Yeah, to... exactly. Oh, you know, I'll watch. But, <laughs> yeah. look, I mean, I, and I agree with this, a load of people have said, I really want them on Blu-ray. And to be yeah. honest with you, just from that kind of, going back to that kind of, I'm a cataloger, I would want them in my collection as well. Yeah. Um, I would love to make that happen, but it's, it's unclear as to whether it can happen now. So yeah. we'll see. Let's talk briefly about one of what I think is the huge successes that you had was this three-year gold package that you released. Um, And this, I mean, did you expect it to sell out as quickly as it did? Was that a a welcome surprise? It's a welcome surprise. I didn't really have any expectations. I just kind of thought, 
I'll leave it up there. Maybe I'll take it down in a month if it doesn't sell. Yeah. Um, but anything was a bonus, really. And I just kind of thought, if I get some sales, great. You know, it helps. Helps with cash flow. Allows me to scale up. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was – it was – just something I thought would be worth doing. Um, mm. I didn't think that it would sell out in like a day or a month <laughs> or anything at all. I just kind of thought, just do it and see what yeah. happens. Um, yeah, and it, it, that I works think for it's, you. in a way, it's the future, really. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why I said, you know, I've got future packages because I, I remember when we did it at Arrow and the feedback was amazing. So I just kind of had that in my head. But I also thought seven years later, I don't have the legacy Arrow has. So who knows? That's why I had no expectations. Yeah. But I know that a lot of people like the idea of having something just come to them that's pre-curated. 100%. And, yeah. um, and that's what I wanted to do. Like I said, I made all these notes about, like, make this, just send that mm. off you know, at some point. So I'm looking forward to, to doing that. And, and I added the Discord in, which has been a yeah. good success as well. People Excellent. seem to be enjoying that. And, and one of the things that I did with the social media when I was launching was – I just sort of thought, well, I can say anything now. I don't have anyone to answer to. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was quite transparent, and mm. um, people really liked it. And I thought, well, great, well, I'll just keep doing that because that's easy. Mm -hmm. uh, easy for me because, yeah. you know, I don't have to come up with stuff. I can just sort of say what I'm doing now. And lots of people really like to understand how things work and what the challenges are. So I want to keep that going. And mm. some of that's going through the Discord, but I want to keep that going on the social media as, as much as I can as well, as long as yeah. I remember. Um, so this was a, a, a three-year gold package. Can we expect a two-year silver, a one-year bronze? Can we get more packages? I think um, anything coming forward will be a bit of a mixture, so it won't be like two-one. Right. Um, what I'm working on right now is, um, because we've got 10 already announced, I don't want to put something out that includes the 10 so people have the hassle of, cancelling orders and then all that right. sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So anything, any packages that come forward won't exclude the 10, will exclude the 10. Um, right. And they'll be sort of for the period roughly where they maybe end uh, going forward. So they'll be part year and I'm thinking about sort of broken down. So some people sort of requested um, like a UK only exclusives package which I'm right. going to try and look at mm -hmm. uh, for people who buy from the US, for instance. Um, yeah. And yeah, going forward, I'm, I'm open to all the feedback, really. So I'll, I'll do those. And then mm -hmm. if people say, can you do this? I'll look at it. And if it can, yeah. I'll, I'll do it for Great. sure. So you mentioned there that you're, you're both operating in the UK and the US. Um, was that a decision you made early on? How, how does that work or how does it impact you logistically? Um, in terms of logistics, it's very little impact, really. I mean, that's the kind of benefit of doing it um, in that it doesn't take a lot of extra work. It's one disc. You know, the packaging, especially as I have it, can be pretty much identical mm -hmm. um, because the OB will only need a change and the sleeve can be the same, essentially. Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, it's nice and easy. But when I started... I knew I was obviously going to be in the UK. I, I, I did consider just US, um, but I'm I live in the UK. Yeah. It's my market, it's my home. So I kind of thought that's that makes sense. But the US, I kind of because I have so much experience there from everything I did at Arrow. I kind of thought it's possible, but I didn't want to start it if I thought I might have trouble sustaining it. I yeah. wanted to do it only if I could do it right. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately, I spoke with MVD, who I worked with all my time at Arrow, and they were interested to partner. So, I, you know, having a partner helped, and, yeah. and we've basically been able to uh, come up with a solution there to to ensure the releases can get out. And mm. and I'd sort of undertaken a review of all the like the long list, and I thought, how many of these could be US? And it was yeah. enough. And so that's what happened. Good. Um, so, how far ahead? Uh, you've obviously got the three-year plan, but how far do you have licenses for? I think you're still acquiring. How many movies do you have in your catalogue so far? Uh, so, how many do I have in the catalogue so far? I mean, yeah. a couple of years 
easy. I mean, I'd like to get through them faster um, yeah. if I can. Um, but, I mean, it's it really depends on how quickly things move that are out of my control. Yeah. Um, you know, how quickly material can be moved or restored or, um, you know, just the extras as well. You know, yeah. in some cases, kind of holding out for someone to, to come back or someone to be available. There's, there's someone, they're working on a release at the moment, and there's someone who I don't think has ever been interviewed, but... I've sort of said let's get let's give it to the end of the year yes you know, four months yeah essentially um so there's things like that you know that well i'll, I'll kind of just juggle essentially mm -hmm. you know if if i get to three months time and find that another title's come ahead i can go oh, let's give that person another month um, yeah to really try and secure that interview mm -hmm. um so it's going to be things like that really but my problem at the moment is I sort of can't stop buying. So <laughs> there's, there's all these films. I mean, like I said, I had this this list of like 800. Yeah. And it's been really refreshing because when I started, I sort of thought, you know, will I be constantly outbid? Will, you know, yeah. people just kind of say, oh, no, thanks. We're used to working with this partner and we're just going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and although that has happened once, um, I've mostly found it quite easy to get titles which right. has been a real surprise. Um, and I think um, in part, you know, it's relationships and mm -hmm. having worked with people for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but also in some cases, you know, I'm just perhaps covering off a niche that some other people aren't doing. So yeah. um, it's good. And, and, and with some of the rarities as well, you know, some filmmakers I've spoken to have never been spoken to before. Right. Um, so they're just delighted that someone wants to release their film and yeah. i'm just kind of kicking myself that i get to release such an amazing film really yeah. um so um so that's great and you know it just kind of makes the whole thing more mm -hmm. exciting and enjoyable for me really yeah and and you've you've partnered with a, a few noticeable uh, notable people most uh, interestingly for me cat ellinger who is come on uh, as i as i that's probably one of your best acquisitions, I would say, so far. Um, is she going to be working solely with you or is she still going to be working with other people? Oh, she's working with loads of people. I mean, she's doing some other producing as well with another right. label, which is mm -hmm. really exciting, you know, for her and for the fans um, on some really cool stuff. Um, she's still going to do her commentaries and her Patreon. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll take as much of her time as I can. Yeah um and yeah i agree you know, it's been great working with her I've worked with her for a, a number of years and the last thing that we did before i left arrows produced a documentary on, on jean roland yeah yep. uh which was really exciting so it just kind of came from that like I just started working closer and closer with cat mm -hmm. that it just felt like a natural evolution in, yep. in our relationship and for her you know she just had a bit of exposure to producing and, and wanted to do more of it so it was the natural conclusion really yeah. um and tom mez very similar you know just sort of started working more and more closely and you know i've worked with tom for forever so one of the first people i worked with at arrow i mean yeah. when i went to university i had him and jasper's book um, midnight eye guide to to japanese cinema and we'll just pour through it so when, i think we did battle royale so like right tom mez <laughs> And uh, he's been a great collaborator and, yeah. um, you know, continues to do exciting work. So that's that's like a, a great core unit you've got there. Is there anybody else you're planning on bringing in to help you? Out? Well, there are other people that I'm working with at the moment as well, but may not be as well known as those guys. But um, I'm working yeah. with Craig Keller uh, on the booklets who did a lot of work with Masters of Cinema right. um, yeah. some years ago. Um, so he's he's been great to work with. Uh, finding some amazing writers and you know he's a french speaker as well so he's translating a lot of articles that have never been translated before for the booklets which is really exciting um johnny mains also working on booklets as well so he's sort of more from um a publishing background so he, he writes and edits books um but he's got a real interest in cinema he's done a few commentaries did a couple for me at arrow um he's done a few for indicator i believe did the snorkel i know that for, yeah. for sure um 
So yeah, Johnny, another person I've just worked with for a long, long time. Um, first worked with him on Happiness of the Katakuris. He's a big Miko fan. And we just kind of chatted on and off for a long time and I knew his work in publishing, so I thought he'd bring an interesting slant to the booklets. Um, so he's on the scene as well. Right. Uh, on acquisitions, was there anything that you missed out or that you were so close to getting or it was disappointing that you couldn't get? Um, no specific title, really. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going for anything that I think would be terribly competitive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things that I want to avoid, I think, is, is doing anything that has kind of had a good release already. I'm, I'm not really interested in, mm. in going over another release where it's got a good master and it's got loads of extras and maybe it's even got nice packaging as well. I'm not really interested in in doing that. Yeah. You know, the UHD upgrade of someone else's Blu-ray, I just kind yeah. of think, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, there might be exceptions to that rule. There is one title that I really, really want, which does have a good uh, release out. Um, but I think that's another one where there's enough people who won't have that release. Right. Um, and, and I can add to it to justify it. So there's always exceptions to the rule. But generally speaking, I think... Not doing that means that labels with deeper pockets than me, are, you know, are going to be yeah. fighting over, you know, those high tier titles. So I can focus on sort of more interesting deep cuts and yeah. releases that are getting the first good release mm -hmm. for the most part. So when you're looking at titles to pick up, do you look at the just something that you love that you want to put out there? Do you look at it as a viable business option, something that's going to give you an influx of cash, it's going to sell it? How do you weigh up? And is there anything, say, bigger or more mainstream in the future? Um, for the moment, I mean, one of the first things I sort of thought was just wanting to do what I want to do, essentially, yeah. and sort of being true to that. Mm -hmm. Um and for the moment, I'm just doing that. I mean, there are things that I think will sell better just because of what they are, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, but for the most part, it's just, is this a good film? Will it make a good release? Yeah. And that's fine. So I'm, I'm not really looking at, let's get this kind of title because we'll need cash here in the budget. And I, I used to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and that was really important, obviously, when you've got, a big business to keep in mind and lots of salaries and overhead. But for now, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, um, I'm not really thinking about the money so much and the, you know, the cash spikes and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking about, is this a good release? I'm yeah. thinking much more about myself. If I were a punter and what would I want to see and what would I want to kind of continue to yeah. follow and, you know, essentially subscribe to. So that's my my guiding principle. It, it must be hard to try and pinpoint something that's going to, to, to get a, a film that you think is going to sell because there must be mistakes in your history where you're like, but this is this is a banker. This is going to be a great release and it just falls flat. Was there any titles that you had, even at Arrow, that just didn't do what you hoped it was going to do? I mean, there's titles that just didn't work. Um, I don't think... Um, I thought any of those titles were going to be great, mm. but when they don't work at all or even lose money, which I think uh, two immediately sprang to mind, uh, because in part, one of them I spoke to someone about recently, but, um, and that's, that's frustrating, but it kind of comes with the territory. I mean, mm. I don't mind saying what they are. Um, not least because one of them's out of print. They're both out of print, I believe, but, um, I'm struggling to remember the title. <laughs> Last American Virgin. It's because it's right. like the remake of Lemon Popsicle. Mm -hmm. um, Last American Virgin, I thought, this is a good movie. You know, it's well-reviewed. Yeah. Um, okay, it's got a downbeat ending, but it's a film I think people want to see. It's 80s, you know, it's nostalgic. Great yeah. sound. And that did not sell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think maybe it's better known in the US. Yeah. Um, maybe it just never had a presence here and people were just say what so that was a bit disappointing um the other one that springs to mind is the taviani box set um yeah okay which is one of my favorite releases you know i really like the tavianis um mm. i was thinking about it because someone mentioned taviani the other day 
but great great box set good extras you know great films mm -hmm. and was a real struggle to sell <laughs> um so sometimes i sort of think god am i gonna be okay when i do stuff like that and that is a bit scary but yeah i'm just kind of taking the plunge really yeah, <laughs> crossing my fingers <laughs> um, so i mean being in the, the city movie world and, and seeing all these releases and all these companies spring up you often hear you know physical media is dead things have changed so dramatically over the past you know 10 15 years with the advent of streaming um i'd say the studios aren't backing physical releases as much i mean you must see it as a viable market if you're still going into it i think you think that it's not going to burst anytime soon well when i started i sort of thought well, i don't know how to do anything else <laughs> uh, this is what I really want to do and if it's just me I've got low overhead so I can kind of make it work you know I just wanted to do it so mm -hmm. that was my thinking initially but in the intervening time and it hasn't even been a long time it's been maybe you know since I first started thinking about it to now maybe a year or so mm -hmm. um, I, I've become much more positive about it I, I, I'm seeing so many more articles and discussions and things that, on a cultural level where people are talking about the importance of physical media and it's not even within the collector's mindset it's it's people just who are much more casual fans and i think mm. that's what gives me confidence because i think there is this um sentiment emerging now where people are sort of saying well great it's on netflix or youtube yeah. or whatever but i want to own it and i mm -hmm. come to the conclusion that it's a bit like it used to be where we'd record films on our VHSs and mm -hmm. okay, we had a copy and I was massively geeky for that and cataloging them and all sorts of stuff, yeah. but I would upgrade them. You know, mm -hmm. I did I, that recording yeah. was not permanent enough for me and mm -hmm. where I could get the VHS and happen to be wherever in our price. Yeah. Um, you know, I would have bought it. And I think more and more people are coming around to that idea that whilst I can watch that movie today on Netflix, it won't be there tomorrow. So yeah. it's a good idea to get a copy. Yeah. So, but also yeah, said as well, I, a lot of the movies that you're releasing are the things that come out. You don't get them on streaming services. They're not the content they want. You know, so Yeah. A lot of these movies, if it wasn't for companies restoration, uh, restoring them, putting them out there in great packages, you, you would never have them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, that's great for me, but I think, you know, I, I, I need to be propped up by the industry at large. So if people are out there and they're buying major studio titles, that means that this industry can exist because mm. whilst it could go on just on the boutiques, I think what would happen is that it'd become like vinyl. And yeah. it may, that may still happen, mm -hmm. but that means it's much more expensive. It means that manufacturing becomes a struggle because everything's clogged up everyone's trying to manufacture yeah yeah you know, less plants essentially um like vinyl at the moment if you want to manufacture you've got you know three four maybe even longer now wait mm. month wait um because there's there's like one pressing plant and mm. and they're all in there trying to do the same thing and if the industry if the blu-ray market and uhd market were to shrink so much that is probably what we'd face into. So hopefully, you know, the industry at large, you know, continues and can, can prop up, you know, boutiques like mine and the others yeah. um, to, to enable that. But um, yeah, I think culturally we're in potentially in for a bit of a bit of a change, not, not the steep drop off that I think people predicted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see with all the boutiques out there, a kind of cannibal cannibalization of the city? fan base of the customer base because there's so many different companies releasing all these wonderful titles that people want to see you just can't get everything yeah i mean that's a, a tough one I, i'm not really sure how to answer to be honest with you yeah. um i mean i think as long as there's diversity people will sort of choose what they're interested in and mm. and i think as you know any label you know the best labels to survive um will you know look after their films and you know make sure they're presented right and create thoughtful extras and you know mm. i think some of the the labels 
may struggle with that and and they're the ones who will eventually sort of fall away or decide yeah. that doing something else is more interesting or or whatever so mm. i think as long as you know quality stays high you know people yeah. in my experience that's what people respond to so i guess finally i want to know what's your hopes for radiance in the future uh what where will the future lead is there anything you can hint towards any more filmmakers maybe even drop a title something <laughs> um i think just more of the same really i mean there's increasing diversity i would say i mean i think there's the initial slate might have seemed like i thought i had a good mix to be honest with you but it might have seemed more art house than not to some people but the next right. few releases are sort of more genre um but they a sort of more thoughtful genre, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. they might yep. seem like something else, but I would argue they're of a higher quality. Right. <laughs> yes, I'd say that way. But yeah, so more genre, really, is what's coming up. Um, but then after that, longer, longer term, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a good mix of sort of really adventurous, lots of first to Blu-ray, lots of first to any disc at all. Um oh looking at um just trying to think of what i can sort of how much i can give away yeah i mean a few different countries in the mix right. um so we've seen a lot of europe mm -hmm. you know france italy uh japan us so there's going to be a bit more added to that in the future um, okay so you know, quick question i suppose to add on I've, I've seen you on social media raving about rrr um, is, are we going to get anything from that kind of part of the world? I would like to. I mean, I think the difficulty there is it's that it's not um, it's not really established in terms mm. of like a work process. Right. So I think what often happens is is that you you kind of go to someone who's not who's not part of dealing maybe with distributors like mine or even. Mm you know, like similar distributors who will operate in a certain way and structure deals in a certain way. And then you sort of go to them and they say, oh no, we want to work like this. And then you just sort of say, well, that's not going to work. Yeah. And, and they just, then you just can't meet. So that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but also just sometimes finding the right people to talk to. I mean, I put out on the, the Arrow social media some years ago, but an interest in Bollywood and there was quite a mixed negative reaction um and i thought even if we could continue even if it was like overwhelming yes absolutely do it yeah the difficulty was like well, where do i start because like i say those distributors you know aren't those producers sorry aren't sort of going to you know the Cannes film festival or the Berlin yeah. film festival where a lot of deals are done um through the sorts of companies that you see regularly represented on disc mm -hmm. so that's another challenge. It's, it's just making contact. Yeah. Although RR is a bit different in that case that, you know, yeah. there are conversations being had, not necessarily with me, but, you know, by those people with other companies, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure, and other, you know, whether they're distributors or, or otherwise, um, you know, there's a, an Oscar campaign building. So I'd be surprised if RRR isn't on disc at some point. Yeah. Um, I'd love it if it was Radiance, but I think... The way it's blown up, yeah. The company with bigger pockets is gonna. But there's a there's, there's a wealth of movies there to be harvested. If if someone can just crack the code, then yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, like I said, you know, when I when I put out the the thing about um, Bollywood for Arrow, my intention then was like, well, could can we do show like can we do Nasib? You know, these these big movies that are just mm -hmm. such fun and yeah, for anyone who's he doesn't know Bollywood I'd say maybe start with those because they're just they're such a good time I mean you know they're on rubbish DVDs and yeah. questionable subtitles but you know that shouldn't detract from enjoying the films and they're absolutely worth seeking out great um so for everybody watching uh in the description box below will be links to all of France social media's YouTube channel where they've got the little um, intro logo for Radiance up there now is that right are you going to be putting more things yeah. on the YouTube channel uh, I'm gonna try. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's just time as ever, but yeah, keep an eye on YouTube. There'll be something up there. Yeah, so all the links are down below. You can go and follow along and 
join the journey of Radiance as they grow to one of the biggest boutiques possibly over the next couple of years. Right, thanks. Fran, thanks very much for your time. I've appreciated it. It's been a great conversation. Thank thanks. you, Grant.